Welcome to SelfDiscoveryWisdom.com, formerly known as Self Discovery Media. On these podcasts, you're going to hear people who speak from the heart. They've taken the journey in life. Many things have happened to them, but they've changed it to happening for them. And in their strength, their courage, they've discovered their abilities and their wisdom, and they are now sharing it here with you. Do enjoy each show. We bring it to you with love and knowing that it's going to help you on your journey of life. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Building Your Business, right here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and all the way from the UK is Patricia Baranowski Schneider. We're going to be talking about her books today, about how she got scammed and ended up in jail. How did that happen? Uh, and also talk about um, business in, uh, in overall. Um, the flyer beware i don't know what the name of the other book is what's the name of the other book love um well i actually have two other books but well, one is called um life's obstacles can be your greatest motivators and that talks about a lot of things that i went through before peru and then the other is investor relations public relations and it's my book on tidbits for helping people in the industry Excellent. And we always need, we always need <laughs> tidbits to help us in the industry, most certainly, no matter what industry you're in. And, you know, whether this is you are in business or just you are the business of your life, all of this information you're going to be hearing today is going to be apropos. So she says her story is one of resilience and stark warning about the hidden dangers lurking behind our borders. She says her harrowing journey not to dwell on the past, but to illuminate the present and shape a safer future for others. After a near fatal accident, and a battle with a brain injury, her life took an unexpected turn. When uh, she was assured, uh, um, sorry, ensnared in an international scam that led to the wrongful imprisonment aboard. That could be rather harassing in itself. The experience, though harrowing and impartial, crucial lesson about the vulnerability and even the most astute among us to the sophisticated deceptions and the shocking realities of the justice system's limitations overseas. Her tale is one of survival, a testament to the human spirits, uh, immobility, and a call to action for greater awareness and support those wrongfully accused. The narrative is more a cautionary trail. It is a, a, life, a lifeline to those navigating similar ordeal, idea, ordeals, ordeals <laughs> and an eye-opening for the uninformed, ensuring that uh, no one else has to endure such an ordeal um, or be uninformed about it. Uh, her profession spans over three decades, beginning the dynamic world of investor relations, public relations, and marketing, where she built a formidable career shaping narratives for business across the spectrum. And a near fatal skydiving accident in 2013 marked a personal and professional turning point, leading to the traumatic brain injury that fundamentally altered her life trajectory. And in that challenging years that followed, the resilience was tested by a sequence of Lipidative scans that preyed upon compromised state and cultivating a wrongful arrest. Well, you know, anybody can get caught into a scam because let's face it, these scams can be incredibly sophisticated. And it's so, so easy to fall into them because you think, you know, I'm intelligent, I'm not going to fall for that, but it's the paperwork looks like it's in place. Everything looks like it's in order. But when it comes down to it, you know, it is a scam. And how do you know? Because sometimes, how do you find those resources that, you know, can show you that it isn't for real? So where are we going to start? The brain injury, <laughs> the the scam, or is it the scam came after the brain injury? Right. Yeah, so the Brain injury, you know, obviously the scams, they're getting worse nowadays. Now I would recognize the red flags to all of us. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately with the brain injury, um, I obviously, someone described it as Swiss cheese where mm. TBI, traumatic brain injury, <clears throat> your brain, for the most part, it's intact, but there's pieces that are missing. So you, like I couldn't see red flags. I couldn't discern right from wrong. Um, and the sad part was doctors couldn't say Will it get better today, tomorrow, a year, 10 years, or not? If it does get better, will it be 1%, 5%, 50%? We don't know. We just have to wait. So on the surface, I appeared fine. I mean, I shouldn't say that. When it first happened, I spent a month in the hospital, had no memory of any of this. And coming home, it was pretty much 
the first three months were hit and miss, what I remember, what I don't. Um, but as I was getting better, on the surface, I appeared totally fine because normal everyday things, I was fine. But talk about scans, which are not common for me. I wasn't understanding these, something's not right. And the crazy part was as they were progressing, I mean, they wiped out my bank accounts and everything. As they got bad, I literally went to my local police station and I said, why do scammers do what they do? Because they can. I went there with all of my proof. I'm victimized here in my home. And I showed them all, like the original scams were here in the U.S. They were in Connecticut, in Texas, and I have all of their contact info. And I'm fighting with the police saying, I need you to do report follows. They basically told me point blank, you were dumb enough to fall for it. What do you want us to do? Your job. I mean, this is why people do what they do. You know, it's sad. So, you know, I never caught on again that all of these scammers were being introduced to me by the same person. I had hired somebody on this online agency. So my daughter had just had my first granddaughter. And I said, okay, I want to be around to, you know, help her. So I hired somebody online, not realizing again, the Swiss cheese, he was introducing me to all these people. So every time I had a slight little bit of doubt of, does that seem right? Yeah, 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 it's totally fine. He was probably in on it all also. So the final skin, yeah, I can't hear you though. The conductor. Gotcha, yeah. You know, and the final scam was basically, they told me, he introduced me to a gentleman that claimed he was the IMF rep for, um, it would work for IMF. And that they were putting together this program. It was for entrepreneurs to help grow your business. And it consisted of debt consolidation because obviously this guy knew all of, how much money I had just lost because he was probably pocketing it. Yeah. But again, I'm thinking, okay, like debt consolidation, that'll help me. But then I can grow the business, hire more people to help, you know, run the company and I could spend more time at my grandbaby. Well, this has me flying to Peru, which again, I'm like, okay, it's not uncommon for my industry, uh, for companies to hire you and fly around the world. They pay for it all because it's a business trip. So anytime I was like, Peru, that's weird. Um, Cause it was supposed to be, you fly to Peru. I was supposed to meet the IMF rep in Peru to sign these um, forms. And on the forms, you affix your passport photo. Yeah. Okay. If that's what you say. Okay. So I do this. And then I was supposed to fly to Peru to Madrid, Madrid to Doha, Doha, Hong Kong. I later learned the whole reasoning for all of this. So with these forms, when I, I never realized Peru was a third world country. It's the most corrupt country I've ever encountered. This is all new to me. So when I hand this man who happened to be a Nigerian man, which I'm told is the IMF rep, yes. I secretly snap a picture of him holding these forms because I want to prove that I gave it to him. Mm -hmm. So I have a picture of this man holding the forms with my passport photo attached. Now, they know the hotel I'm at because they book it. I later learned they basically own these hotels. They <laughs> keep track of who you are, what you do, who you're talking to, to make sure you're going to do what they tell you to do. So with this, he tells me the man you're going to meet in Hong Kong, he got called to a meeting. He had to grab his suit. He had to run. But you're going to be meeting him. Can you bring him his luggage? And I'm like, why me? And he says, he's the one initiating you into this program. It's the least you could do. Okay, if that's what you say. Again, not thank you. So they give it to me. They open up every nook and cranny. Looks like a used luggage to me. I don't see anything weird. I'm like, okay. Well, again, they now know where I'm going, what hotel, uh, what airport, what time my flight is, and all that stuff. Because they book it. So anyway, I wind up going to the airport. And of course, I'm surrounded by cops. You see the airport video where they have that exact passport photo that I have a picture of this Nigerian man holding circulating it to the police in the airport saying, look out for her. She should be coming. Oh, the minute wow. I get out of, the, out of the taxi, there there she is. So they're all in it together, which unfortunately, the U.S. knows this, but they do nothing. They So anyway, um, I get surrounded by police and I'm thinking, this is insane. Let's, and now the crazy part was too, when all this happened, this Nigerian man tells me, take everything out of your luggage and put it into this luggage, which I later learned is a big thing because how do you then tell the police that's not mine because yeah. all your stuff's in it. But at the time I had just bought that luggage. 
So yeah. when he says that, I'm like, I just bought it. I'm not going to throw it away. He says, yeah, throw it away. Put all your stuff in here. And I'm like, I just bought it. And he takes out his wallet and says, how much? I'll give you the money for it. So it's not the point. I like this luggage. Mm-hmm. I just bought mm-hmm. it. So he's, I said, why would I do that? He says, you're a girl. You shouldn't have to carry two luggages. I'm like, I'm a big girl. I'll be okay. So I went with the two luggages. And so the, now in the U.S., when you go to the airport, they always ask you, is this your luggage? Did anybody give you anything? Did you take your eye off the luggage? Blah, blah, blah. They don't ask you anything. So I check in the luggage. Bam. Police everywhere. You would have thought I was a celebrity. Cameras everywhere. And I'm like, what's going on? So they would like, follow me. I'm like, for what? He said, follow me. So I go back and they tell me, we have reason to believe you have drugs in the bag. And I'm like, that's insane. I don't, of course, my bag totally fine. This bag, they swab it with something that turns blue that apparently means that there's drugs in the bag. And I'm thinking, where? I opened up every nook and cranny. I didn't see anything in here. I'm not a drug smuggler, so I don't know how they do it. They saw open the casing and sure enough, there's cocaine. Yeah. And now I'm thinking like, oh, okay, I'm thinking U.S. terms. I have all the proof in the world. That's not why not. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter. And here, they, here in the U.S., you would have to prove somebody's felt here. It doesn't matter. They said you did it. You did it. That's a case yeah. closed. Yeah. So that was kind of how I wound up in that whole situation. And unfortunately for me, I know nothing about this country. They basically took everything from me. I had my wedding rings, which were a family heirloom, and my husband's like gone. Well, I had two thousand dollars in cash, um, all my credit cards, my Rolex watch, my fourteen karat gold um, necklaces, everything gone, never to be seen again. Mm. I had a brand new iPhone, which was ten days old. My iPad, iPod, everything gone, never to be seen again. And the embassy ends up coming to the airport. And I'm speaking to the woman, and I'm like, this is insane. Back home, my friends are DEA, FBI. I'm like, these are all my friends. I said, it doesn't matter. You're in another country. You have to do at least three years here. And I'm like, no. I said, no, my family's going to fight for me. This is insane. Thinking U.S. terms. We have all the proof in the world. Apparently, it falls on deaf ears. And they don't care because it's a business for them. Yeah. Our money was like 4.5 times their money. You have to pay to bring it, be in jail here. You have to pay for your food, pay for the lights, pay for everything. It's How do people do that. that if they're not making money or haven't got any money because it's all been taken from them? Well, with a lot of, I've met a lot of people through the years in there. Um, not everybody, a lot of people fell for scams just like me. Mm-hmm. The others knew what they were doing, but didn't think they'd get, they didn't realize they were being set up to get caught mm-hmm. because they need you to get caught or they sneak more stuff through. Right. So most of the people in that situation were either drug addicts who needed money or just for people who wanted money. Mm-hmm. So now they don't have the money to, to pay for anything. So now you have to work around in the prison to make money because you have to pay these dues. And what happens, what they do there is they have what they call benefits where you do one there, you pay these astronomical fines, um, you work, you do behave. And if you pay your fines, you can get out on one third of your time. The majority of those people don't have the money for that. So they're God. stuck. And the place here, they get astronomical t- sentences. Like there was a girl there, she was um, 18 when she got arrested. She was 36 when she was 18 years. I said, oh my God, did she kill somebody? Oh, drugs. And I'm like, oh my God, they're, they're sentences because it's a business. And, 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 and yeah, and of course there's no justice. The, the justice is non-existent. Hmm. Like even through the whole fight, like we went up hiring, unfortunately, the only communication we had is through the embassy hmm. who we got a lawyer off the, the U.S. Embassy website, which was the only speaking uh, English-speaking lawyer. who turned out to be another skin, and oh, I swear God. he was just in the embassy's back pocket. So he made my situation worse, did nothing but rob us blind and did nothing. So, you know, it, it's, it's just, oh, it's such a skin, the whole entire situation. I was there for four years. I mean, what? I, yeah, four years. I had my brand new grandbabies, eight months old when I went there. I had two new grandbabies that I hadn't oh. even met yet. My business just about crumbled. And it was like, how, how, where was the US to help me? And it wasn't just me. Like, there was a 74 year old woman from um, Arizona. She had a cell phone to get a, a, a money for a lawyer. She, a lot of what the elderly fall for the love scam, which is a big thing apparently. So now she finally gets released, but now she has no home to go to. There was a 75 year old man from New Jersey who was a severe diabetic. In this third world country, they're stealing his money. I'm sorry, stealing his insulin. 
So now he winds up in a coma. He almost lost his eyesight. Again, where was the thing she helping him? But yet, when I look at things like um, Brittany Griner, the basketball player, I don't know if I can't say anything bad about it. I, all I know is the U.S. went to that to get her home because she's someone with a name. Yes. Who am I? And I'm like, that's a disgrace because I was just one of many people that I saw there that did not belong there. But I don't understand don't why, you know, I mean, your family on the other side must be, you know, doing everything they can with the American consulate in America, you know, of how do we get her out? I mean, all is, is getting, yeah, all they were told is we can't interfere with the law. But you what do you mean you can't interfere wrong. with the law? Like, where is the justice? Where is your court date? You know, you had all this proof. I mean, it, 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 just to show you how bad it was, like in here, they have a trial quiet, utmost attention. They under they want to listen and hear everything. There, three look three judges. We're pleading our case. I have all my medical records, my family's running back and forth, getting them transcribed into Spanish, blah blah blah, doing everything we possibly can. We go there with all the proof. Three judges, we're pleading our case. Two of them are having a whole conversation. They're on their phones laughing, gave them not paying attention to anything. The other one, um, he's he's pretty much laughing. He's on his phone laughing. Nobody paid any attention. When we're all said and done, we were like, hello, we're finished. We got told, oh, okay, yeah, cool. Say innocent one more time, 15 years. Say not as innocent, we'll give you well. And I'm like, you give me no choice but to plead guilty to something I'm not guilty of. They don't care what you have to no. say. I mean, they're all in on that. it, right? I mean, it's like, it's just... can this be taken to an international court? Can something be done there? Or do this like, ah, oh, no, there's just scammers. Well, if one goes, another pops up and they don't care. I mean, that was the whole point of even writing my book and telling my story. And, yeah. you know, I want people to know that because like in hindsight, when my kids were little, I remember taking them to Cancun. And it seemed when you're on the resort, you're totally fine. But at one point, we were like, let's go off the resort, see how the locals like, blah, blah, blah. We're walking around. You could tell the neighborhood started getting shady. People were coming up to me, some trying to sell them drugs. And we were like, you know what? Let's go back to the resort. In hindsight, this could have happened to us then. Yes. And, you know, it, it, it's just, it's a shame. And what's sad about it is, like, I did another article. And people don't understand. TBI, I've never had it before, so I can't say. Everybody's different. Not everybody has the same injury. Not everybody, it doesn't affect them all the same. So we wrote this story, and everybody's writing, oh, shut up. You're such a scammer. You just you just look to try to get a quick buck. Um, I had a brain thing and it was fine. I would never take a word. It's blah blah blah. And it's like, okay, first of all, my business at the time, for whatever the amount of drugs that were in the bag, my business was making me per month. Why would I fly to Peru right. for that amount of money? It made and if yeah. I was into that sort of thing, I probably could go up the road and get it. I didn't mm -hmm. need to fly to Peru. It made no sense. And just because you fell and hit your head. I was in a skydiving accident. I fell 5,000 feet in the air. I mean, trust me, whatever injury you have cannot comp com compete with me. And everybody's is different. Mm -hmm. So it got to the point where it's like, I'm over here trying to bring awareness to this because I think it's something people need to know. And yet I'm getting badgered. And it's yes. like, I, I'm not the scammer, trust me. <laughs> like, right. It's the world we live in. You know, I always how, say, why? How, how did you only serve four years out of the 15? What got you out? Well, no, I pled guilty. So then they sentenced me to 6.10 years. In theory, I should have been out in three, uh, actually two and a half years. But again, because of the lawyer that I had, um, I wound up doing more time. All he did was take me, like here, if you have a lawyer, you, they give an itemized bill, they tell you what they're doing. There, no, we had to pay US dollars, again, for 4.5, almost $5,000 a month. Think of the math for that. On top of that, everything kept me paying this, we're working hard, we're working. Yeah. We don't know. We're like, okay. So this goes on for a year. Then he tells my family started pushing him because I had no contact with court at all. Mm -hmm. So they started pushing him and they said, okay, we need to, what's going on here? So he winds up saying, he files a habeas corpus on the one judge and gets me house arrest. And I'm thinking, I'm going home. No, house arrest in Peru. That was even worse because when I was in the first prison, I worked for the daycare there because women that can have babies up until three years old. It gave me something to do because I didn't speak or understand the language. So what else was I going to do? Mm -hmm. So at least I got to play with babies. That was fun. But now you turn around and you put me in a home and checked on four times a day by the police. So I can't go anywhere. I'm um, here. The internet and phone, 85% of the day didn't work. It's now I'm home, bored out of my mind. I'm going stir crazy. My family's not there. I was so depressed. I was like, this is like solitary confinement. So we did that for you. 
And that's when we kept saying, all right, so now that's two years he's getting paid and nothing at all is happening. So he had told me and my family when I went to house arrest, that house arrest counts as time served. We kept repeating that over and over again. It counts as time served. So anyway, um, when we finally pushed him and said, okay, what's going on? We have to get the courts involved. That's when we had the court date and I had to plead guilty. He tells me at that point, don't worry about it. It counts as time served. You've already done two years. You only have to do like three more months and then you go home. I'm like, okay, now I'm thinking I'm going to go back to that first prison and visit. No. Now they send me someplace else, way up in the mountain, totally different place, which was the men's prison, which they actually had a section for foreigners. Um, but there was so much stuff. Like even when you get transferred, I mean, you're basically put in the back of kind of like an ambulance. It's roach infested. There's roaches everywhere. It's pitch black. There's no window. And it would normally fit eight people. They've got about 15 to 20 people back there, and mostly men. So you can imagine your growth from time. It just was not fun. They don't care. So I wound up going to that one prison, stayed there for four months. Through the whole time, I kept saying, everybody was telling me you need to get a copy of your, your sentence. I kept saying, okay, the lawyer says it's not ready. I kept pushing, pushing, pushing. People saying it's not ready. I get another lawyer to get it for me. There it was, black and white, cancerless, don't count this time soon. My heart sunk, and I'm like, are you kidding me? That whole depressed year, I have to do again? Uh -huh. So I call him up, but since I'm in a new prison, the number didn't show up. Like, it didn't say where I was, so he picked it up. And I said, did you get a copy of my sentence? He said, no, no, it's not ready yet. I said, it's funny because I'm holding it right now, and it says house arrest don't count. Uh, he says, oh, no, no, it does. Don't worry about it. I'll hand it. Of course, now he knows how my number shows up. He don't pick up the phone anymore. So we wound up getting another lawyer, which should be on the website because he was phenomenal. He's gotten so many other Americans released. He goes through hoops to try to get, you know, get me done. But now I'm there for four months. Now they're transferring me to another one. I said I must have been on a tour of the Caribbean prisons. It was ridiculous. The biggest issue, too, in all these places, not only are they rat infested, roach infested, the majority of them don't give you water. So like in one room I went to, there was... 18 of us sharing the room. One, one place didn't even have a toilet and had a hole in the floor. That's your bathroom. I'm like between my back that was broken in the accident, my bad knees. I mean, I'm not 15. I'm a yes. woman. Now you got a squat over a hole in the floor. I'm like, this is insane. You know, and then the majority of the time you didn't have water. So now you've got 18 people, you know, whether the one person had a hole, one person had a toilet, either way, now you don't have water to flush the toilet. They had a barrel, which is what you use to get water out and try to bathe yourself with, wash your dishes with, or flush the toilet. 18 people, that, that's gone in an hour. So now sometimes you go three, four days with no water. And now at this point, I'm dealing with menopause, so I'm drenched. It was like, I was like in an oven. And all I kept doing was wetting my hair. Because I'm like, I don't know, I'm just dying. It was just so much was going on. Like, they, they had no, no care in the world for Americans or foreigners in general because they feel you came to our country to commit a crime, you deserve what you get. I didn't come to your country to commit a crime. Not everybody here deserves to be here. Yeah. But they, and then they put me on this crazy medication. They felt no reason I couldn't communicate with them. Um, one was called clonazepam, one was called fluoxetine, which I'm told was for bipolar and depression. This is when it all first happened. I'm like, I have never been diagnosed with any of this. And how did you? based off that off my face. Yeah. I told this to the embassy. They didn't care. But everything with them is the boilerplate. I'll make a note of it. So now I'm putting this medicine, which is putting them in a coma every night. I'm getting robbed of wine. And it, it, there's nothing we could do about it. When I first got there, I had to sleep on the floor, which again, rats and roach, I, they were just everywhere. Yeah. I had to sleep on the floor for the first couple of months. Then I was put in a room, which is where the TV was. And these people were pigs. I mean, you could be talking to them. They're picking their nose, they're farting, they eat and just drop everything right where they stand. That's just normal for them. So now the room that I went to was near where, where the TV room was. So you can imagine the crowd that was put all around my bed. So you can imagine the road situation there. And it's just one after the other after the other. And again, I'm like, this is, I'm told that for some of the people there, like the Peruvians, that that was even better than their home. So a lot of them like to be in jail. I'm like, that couldn't be fully from the truth for me. I don't deserve to be here. This is not my life. And there was nothing I could do about it because we wrote, you know, my family, they wrote to every politician in the world, um, Montel Williams, Oprah, you name it, we wrote to them. Nobody cared. 
the only congressman that even my husband works for this, the town that we live in, Long Island, um, Peter King was the politician at that time. He was the only one, only one who acknowledged us. But all he could do was, re, you know, talk to the embassy. Who? That was it. Of course, they're going to tell you whatever you want. Yeah, they're on, they're going to tell you whatever it is you want to hear. Not that they're doing it. You know, it was just an unbelievable. And the emotional roller coaster from once this will happen, you're going to go home. You're going to go home. We're going to get you out. No, you're going home within Peru. Once it counts as time served, don't worry. Then he tells me, once you're out, you never go back. Then I'm going back. Then it was only going back for two, three months. Then it was no another year. Then COVID happened. Then I got COVID there. Then there's no flights coming. It was just, I was to the point, like I'm not a suicidal person, but I, like yeah. they say, you, you have to, have guns. there's a breaking point. Yeah. They say you can't have guns, you can't have knives, you can't have drugs, you can have whatever you want there. Money talks. So there were knives everywhere. And I contemplated, I was like, I had it all planned. I was like, I can't do any more of this. I mean, the more ironic thing is my son had written me a really nice letter. And I was like, it just came at the right time. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to be yeah. here for him. But it's like, you know, people don't realize what what you go through. I mean, yeah, I would always hear like, oh, other people have it worse. I'm sure they do. Like they, some people would tell me, you're lucky you didn't go to Hong Kong because there is the death penalty. The death penalty. But to be honest, part of me was like, but then it would have been over. And like I said, these scammers know what they're doing because here my friends have said, like DEA, FBI, they were saying if your flight was having you come back to New York, they could have pulled me back. But because it had me, I was never supposed to leave Peru, but because the itinerary had me going to another country, they couldn't do anything. So these scams know exactly what they're doing, what country to put you in, who's corrupt, who's not, how to play the game. And I'm I was told by my FBI friend that these scams were by medical records of people with brain injuries, dementia, senility. Mm. It's not legal, but they do, because they know you're, you're going to fall through it. I said, it's just, a, it's a shame. But again, why do they do it? Because no one stops them. Well, that's the problem. You know, you kind of watch these movies of vigilantes going in and rescue people and you kind of think you know how can that happen well after hearing this story of it that seems to be the only way it can happen mm -hmm. right going in there and and shooting them up and getting people out because it's well, just as bizarre as you know well, that's what why you... i call the book fly everywhere because it's like just know that once you cross a border god forbid something happens you're on your own and the funny part was like some of my friends, you know, my skydiver friends, they were always like, oh, my God, we're going to come. We're going to scoop you back out. We're going to steal you. But the crazy part is U.S. has an expedition clause. So even if they did that, they take me right back. So it was kind of like it doesn't even pay. Yeah. You know, I, it's, I don't know what the connection is, why the U.S. doesn't do anything at all. But I'm like, it's just a shame because, like I said, I was one of the many Americans that I found. I don't there. understand. I mean, you're meant to protect your citizens no matter where they are. I and said, like, and yeah. all your proof was at home of everything that you'd gone through. My right? family sent everything. They, right. went to, um, they had it translated into Spanish. They shipped it over to the consulate. They didn't care. They didn't care at all. There has to be, I mean... I mean, like, you know, I've been doing this a long time, nearly 12 years now, and I've heard some stories. This is the first one I've heard like this, but most certainly of injustices. And, you know, the one thing that I've, I've done expose shows on, which this is kind of, you know, military, clergy, yeah. uh, police force, um, of how they'll do anything to protect their own and, and forget about the injustice of it. And, but, you know, when you're looking at, the citizens of the country that have been scammed like this and that I don't care if you go to the consulate and the consulate ignores it. There has to be some organization that puts pressure mm -hmm. on them and say, no, they fought to get that young girl out. Why can't they fought to get the rest of the citizens out? Are you all chopped liver? Is it only yeah. because she's famous? You know, I, I, surely yeah, that would have brought more attention to more people yeah. that have been held there innocently. It's, that's what I said. It's um, unless you, ha I learned a whole lot, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I said, unless you have a name, you're some of power, or it's always like, what's in it for me? Yes. Doesn't care. Like I said, the 75 year old man who they stole his insulin and he was in a coma, almost lost his eyesight. By the time he found, he got the second lawyer. We both had that same first lawyer. That's how I met his wife. And then she wound up using the same second lawyer that I did who got him home. And now she tells me, like, through everything, now he's got dementia. They had to put him in a home. I said, "You think your goals from years would be spent with family? 
you know, he spends years in, in the in, in justice of Peru with no help from his country to come home. I'm sure stealing his insulin and putting him in a coma didn't help his escalation to dementia. And I'm like, again, the U.S. just says, eh, not my problem. I'm like, I, I had said when Whose I first problem come is home, it then, though? Whose problem yeah, is it? Know. You know, if, if you're not there to defend the innocent, right? And, um, you know, people, well, you shouldn't have fallen for the scam. These scams. You know, that I, easy. They they are very very sophisticated, and unless you have, you know, somebody whose electronic can follow the the thread of where everything is coming from, you know, mm. your, your own little CIA person on your shoulder, mm. right? It's very easy to fall for them. I've been hit with them myself, and I mm. nowhere near got caught to that level. Yeah. Um, but but it's very very easy. Uh, well, the crazy part is there's a, a company in Australia called StartNewVictims.org. Mm -hmm. And I had reached out to them when he was on house arrest and they pro bono investigated everything. The person, this so-called Nigerian IMF person, we were communicating beforehand on Skype and he was calling from my neighbor. They researched it. They said he's calling from a landline in London. So he's findable that the U.S. just says, didn't happen in our country, I don't care. But you can stop them from doing this to other victims in the US. Exactly. You what you do something. is you hand that information over to the London office and saying, look, okay. these people. I mean, but it, it, we really, you know, you know, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, most certainly, yeah. because, you know, let's let's just look at it, all these pathetic wars, uh, people up in arms, me rights, me rights and, and all mm -hmm. of this type of thing. You know, it, it's for all the sophistication that is given to us through technology and opportunities to grow yes. and be. It's just getting worse. And it's like the question is on human nature. You have all the opportunities in the world to triumph you know, mm -hmm. uh, ethically. And yet people still choose, you know, to to feed the other. People like that have no heart, and no soul. They're just not connected oh, to that conscience whatsoever. Um, one of the girls that was in the prison with me, she was from South Africa, and she was saying that there was a lot of Nigerian scammers there. She said, and I can't speak for all, so I don't want to be criticized for that, but she said they'll basically sell their mother for a buck. She's like, they have no soul whatsoever. Yeah. And the crazy part was with like help, even when I was in the apartment, my family tried to do a um, petition, thinking if we get enough signatures, blah, 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 that people would maybe, mm -hmm. you know, do something. So we're circulating the petition link online. Every time everybody posted it, Facebook would yank it. And they kept saying, that's weird. They posted it. Yet. And it seemed anytime you say something negative about the U.S., it would get pulled. It's like they, there is nowhere to go for help. It's just, it's a, it's a shame. Well, you know, it's... There is a, a great organization called the Abol Abolitionists. They, they work for the CIA on, the, on uh, trafficking. And he went off on his own and formed his own company so that he didn't have the restrictions. Mm -hmm. And he said, sometimes you've just got to, you've got to put yourself in the criminal's mindset and, and a criminal arena. And can, that's the way you are going to win instead of this other limited and treating these people as human because they're not. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that will inflict suffering on other people for their own gain. Are, are, mm -hmm. I mean, let's not call them animals. Animals are better than them. You know, the one woman, she had a six month old baby and a lot of people fall for the love scam. She fell for someone else. Same story. He should say, you had a baby. We met online. Um, I want to send you on this vacation. You need the break, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to give you money. I'm going to give you a luggage to buy all these souvenirs. She gets arrested. She has a six month old baby at home. How do you do this to her? I mean, people just don't care. They are heartless. And again, she don't have the money. She can't pay her funds. She's stuck doing this time. And it's like, your heart goes out to everybody because I'm like, it, all I get told is everybody here is a crime. Not everybody is, and not everybody deserves to be there. And even if, God forbid, they did something and it was their first offense, the astronomical sentence times that they give there yes. is insane. I mean, it, it's insane. The one girl had two joints. She was seven years. I'm up to have two joints in your pocket. Okay. But they're making money on you, so they don't care. Yeah, I just don't understand why we don't have like an international uh, group of people from all over the world that, that this is all they do. Mm -hmm. They go after the scammers. They free the innocent. Uh, and this is what they do. Billionaires out there, right? Yeah. Put your money somewhere where it's going to count. For right. Sure. Of for, 
we're go so going backwards in society. You know, we've, we've got more homeless people. We've got um, you know, more heartless people. Um, because whenever people are down and out, you've always got the vulture ready there. Right. right. Well, and that's the biggest issue that we're having here in the U.S. now, because I, I don't know if you're having it there, too, but like the immigration and everything. And of course, I don't want to get politics and all that stuff involved. But, you know, they're putting billions of dollars into this. You're willing to help other people from other countries. But what about us? Yes. We're from this country. I pay tax dollars for yes. decades. That's what I said when I come home. I should never have to pay taxes again, because what did I get for it? You've done right. nothing for me. Yes. yes. <laughs> so how did you finally get free? I wound up getting the new lawyer and I had a complete when I sold for one third of my time, paying my fines, which I paid through him. And even on top of that, the funny part was in order for me to get house arrest, my mom had to put up sixty thousand dollars bail. Of course, they don't want to give any of that back. But we were like fighting. We didn't get back till I was home and that lawyer went to bat for me. But anyway, they what they do, they have a bad habit of trying to keep you there longer. So for example, misspelling of a name. Something like that could keep you there for two years. Like Most it. people don't catch it or they don't have the money to hire a lawyer to fight yeah. it. So when this all first happened, like my name, Baranowski Schneider, Baranowski was correct. Schneider was wrong. If you tell them, okay, the lawyer went forward. They think Schneider go in and misspell Baranowski. Something like that could keep me there two more years. And so we had a good lawyer at this point who was fighting for that. How it all happened too is that when this will happen around the holidays. So they were doing it because in this Christmas thing where every different section of the prison was in competition of costumes, performance, all this crap. So it just so happened that that day, everybody who was employed at the prison, the, the psychologist, the, the prison uh, lawyer, like everybody happened to be there that day. Normally they wouldn't have been. The courts didn't know this. So as we had the court, first time we tried to do internet wasn't working. We had to reschedule for another month. Blah, blah, blah. Normally it would be rescheduled months later. But again, this new lawyer was going to bat for me. He was like, no, we need to get it now. So now we happen to have the online court because it was COVID. Before that, it was just a horrendous review. So now we have an online thing. And now they say, well, we need to speak to the psychologist. We need to speak to the prison lawyer. We need to speak to this person. Normally, they wouldn't be there and we'd be like, well, we'll reschedule it in six months. It just so happened they were there that day. And even after the fact, they were all telling me, like, that was so weird. Why they want to talk to me? I don't even know you. But this is the game they play. Mm -hmm. Then they're trying, it turns out the director of the prison, actually, she was, a, no offense, a hard ass, but she she did have a soft spot for me because she knew I didn't believe her. Mm -hmm. But she's doing her job and that's fine. So they started telling her, well, I don't know if we should let her go because no one will leave. We would have to go and inspect the phone, make sure she's going to a good place. How do we know she's not going to a bad environment? She'd come back and do it again. And she says she's not even going to be in this country. What do you care? So because of her pushing for me, mm. they, but then they tell you after court, we'll let you know. Are you kidding me? So this, again, that could go on for six months. But this new lawyer was there every day knocking on the door. We need to know. We need to know. We need an answer. So they finally said, okay, she can go. But now I'm thinking COVID, they're blocking borders, we can't get in. And I'm like, please. It was it was actually right before Christmas again. And all I kept thinking is it's my last Christmas. That's the only thing I could be happy about. So I came home after after New Year's, but I knew it was my last one. And the crazy part was I kept saying it's a country of anything, it, anything that you think could happen probably will. So I said I wouldn't be happy and be able to breathe till the plane wheels left the ground. So once it left, I landed on JFK and I finally come home. You know, my husband and my daughter came to pick me up, but they're outside because COVID, they wouldn't let them in. Now I get, I guess my passport was flagged as a drug trafficker. So now I get pulled aside from immigration here. And I didn't catch on. And I'm like, okay, but I only had a little bag. I didn't have much in it. And when I was there, I was studying with a lot of Bible study people because they spoke English. Um, so they were putting Bible passages and I had notes from my son and stuff. I don't know if they thought the Bible passages were code for code, uh, drugs and stuff. They're taking it, they're passing it. And I'm finally realize what's going on. I'm like, are you serious? If you did your job originally, I wouldn't have been in this mess in the first place. So he says, we could do whatever we want. And that they're checking my son's letters and everything. I'm like, that's my own personal stuff. They said, we could do whatever we want. We could check everything. We could check you. We could check the inside and out, blah, blah, blah. That turned into a strip search. Now my husband and my daughter are sitting here like, it's been like an hour and a half. Everybody's left the flight, including the pilots. Now they're calling the lawyer. Did she get on the plane? What's going on? 
by the time I finally got to them, I'm like, I'm done. I'm like, I literally, I'm drained. I just want to get back to my life. I said, I, it, it, they, the U.S. was like just as bad as they were. And I'm like, you should be ashamed of yourself because if you did your job, I wouldn't have even been in a situation. Yeah. So I said, I'll never get a passport again. <laughs> That's it. You know, unfortunately, there's a, there's a lot of very good people that put on a uniform for whatever reason because they believe in it and they believe what it stands for. But yeah. you've got an awful lot of people that are charlatans, that are bullies, you know, that are hiding behind the uniform for the benefits, right? You well, know, the bad part about it is even my friends who are FBI and DEA, they were even going to their high end saying, I wrote all the letters, I did it help, but they can't do it themselves. It has to go to their superiors. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at it. Mm-hmm. They can't do anything they wanted to, but it goes through the hierarchy. And my husband used to say, the minute drugs are mentioned, nobody wants to deal with it. But I mean, I've never been in trouble with the law, maybe a traffic ticket. I mean, other than that, I'm a successful, I was a successful business owner. I had a family, never been in trouble. Do the, do the research, Google my name. I'm not, yes. not a bad person, yes. you know, and you don't care. No, no. I, you know, this is, you know, the kind of the theme for everything. They don't care. I think that's what we're going to call the show. They simply yeah. don't care. And so, that is the shame of it, is what, what, what's happened to us. You know, are people so numb? Are they so lost? Mm-hmm. Are they so greedy? Are they so selfish? Are they so narcissistic that they simply do not care? And, mm-hmm. you know, we've, we've got politicians that are bona fide narcissists that they don't care as long as they get what they want. They exactly. don't care who pays the price. And if you've got that kind of leadership, then unfortunately, that's the, you know, it gives permission for everyone else. Well, why should I care? Why should mm-hmm. I care? And mm-hmm. it's like, it's, it's your heart and soul that's missing, right? What are you? You're just a humanoid piece of scum that doesn't yeah. care and doesn't care what you do. Where is your self-integrity? Where is your heart and soul? And if it happened to them or someone they love, it would change. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, if it even happened to them, and you know, it's with Phil mm-hmm. that, uh, yes, it's 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 quite horrific that you really didn't have a leg to stand on. It didn't matter where you turned. It's mm-hmm. like I don't care. I don't well, care. I, I got to the point where I knew, like, my husband was going crazy. He had to take on a second job because I was, you know, helping, and now I'm not there. And my family was jumping through loops. And it took probably the first two and a half years when I started to realize this is not working. And then I'm kind of arguing with them because I was like, just stop. And they're like, oh, but we're doing, I understand you want to help. I would be the same way. But honestly, I'm here. It's not going to matter. Mm. It, it really it gets to the point where it's like, you just have to suck it up because there's nothing you could do that's going to change this. I realized it took a while. And at this point, my brain was starting to get better. And I'm like, okay, now I see what's going on. But it's like, I, I, I would be the same way. Everybody felt so helpless. It's like, there's nothing you could do. Nothing is going to matter. We reached out to everybody. It was relevant. And, you know, quite honestly, uh, A, there needs to be a movie done on this because that's actually what really does, you know, hit people when people actually see it on TV and this is a real story that really happened. Uh, But but people still will think, well, it won't happen to me. Well, I used to think that too. mm -hmm. It it can happen to any one of us. And the thing is, is um, you can't, I mean, look at it. You had all the documentation. Right. So you can say, well, I, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. But they don't, don't care. care. Exactly. Right. They don't care. It's what can they get from you? Yeah. And once they've got from you, how do they spit you out? Or how can they milk your family? Yeah. You know, in order to, to keep you alive. And it's. Uh, well, it, you know, it's funny with that, too. It's like when I was in house arrest, we had a cop who was checking on us four times a day. And my family, you know, he was actually also driving a taxi to try to get money for his daughter in college. So when my mom would come to visit me, we'd say, okay, get brownie points, we'll use him to take the taxi. So he got to know us and he tells my mom, when you come, she would come for three weeks. He says, don't bring, bring only a carry on luggage, don't check a luggage. She's like, but I'm going for three weeks. He says, don't do it. Mm-hmm. Because what happened is if they catch a Peruvian of drugs, they're not gonna make any money. They yeah. wanna catch an American. So here again, you have to prove stuff. There you check a luggage, they have a Peruvian, they're gonna say, okay, Take it off this one, stick it on yours, and then you'll be in jail at your door. Right. So this is coming from a local cop who knows yeah. the system. He was like, you know, they don't, they want your whole family. And that's a big thing there. If they go to a house, and like one girl was there, she had three kids. The oldest kid, I think, was 17. She happened to be visiting her brother, and I guess they raided the house, and they found drugs. The whole family got arrested. 
she, her 17 does not mother all the kids because everybody else is in jail because it's a money business. And I'm like, and you wonder why you're a third world country. Yeah. You'll never exactly. change like this. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I think we're getting to a third world world. <laughs> in many ways, you know. And you're kind of, this is the test of humanity. You know, yeah. like if a story like this and other stories that, that I have, I've shared through the years, if they don't upset you, if they don't bother you, if you if you don't you know start looking and being aware now we don't want you to go through life constantly on age suspicious and that everybody's evil because that's not a way to live but to actually look at other people that you know are being vulnerable and stand by them stand up for them and it's because everybody turns the other cheek it's not my business it's not my business well yes it is because there's the trickle down effect Right. And that more and more people that get victimized like this, the more and more these other people, I'm getting away with it. I can expand on this. And of course, now we're seeing it in politics uh, where there used to be some sort of accountability and ethics. And now there's absolutely zero. And it's like, yes, you're, you're being scammed openly, openly here. Right? And you're buying into it. And right, you may not end up in a Peru jail, but you're going to end up in some form of prison uh, even if it's of your own consciousness. So, yeah. It's a shame. I, as I said, the world we're living in now, I'm like, I, I feel like I'm in another planet. I, I said years ago when I was a kid and you were in school and we had, you know, politicians and government was here for the people and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, none of that exists anymore. Between no. medical and, and politicians, blah, yes. blah, blah. It's how much money could we get? I'm yes. like, it's, it's yeah. a shame. And, and you know, it's, it's like the scum always rise to the top, right? And so yeah. basically it's up to us to scoop them out because yeah. underneath that is goodness. But mm -hmm. through the years of the various scamming and the backhanding and the turning the other cheek that's been going on for so long and so escalated, you know, now it's got to be, it's more mainstream. It's just the way mm -hmm. it is. Just got to accept it. No, we don't. We yeah. don't have to accept it. We have to speak out. We have to keep sharing the story. We have to keep um, letting people know what's going on out there. Because if we don't, then they're just going to keep getting away with it. And as politicians and as a police force or anything else that are all being bought off, then it's the citizens that have to stand up. You know, they to stand the up for everything else. You know, yes, like, go on, what about some important? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, all lives matter, folks. And and it's uh, yeah. we are being taken advantage of. And um, and you know, social media is the culprit to a point because that is a a great way of getting people in and sensationalizing things. But at the same time, we've got to remember we're an algorithm. We're feeding yeah. an algorithm, um, and if we're buying all the you know the hate and everything out there and getting down on that escalate that's who we're going to be so yeah. what do you stand for as a human being and how are you going to step up because mm -hmm. i don't care how rich you are and how much money they coin in without self-love or self-integrity what have you got you're mm -hmm. just a poor con artist that's it mm -hmm. well that's right. what i said even sharing the story it wasn't you know i mean I was hesitant at first because I'm like, well, you know, that's going to affect my business and I don't want to air my dirty laundry out. But at the same time, I'm like, people need to know this because yes. this is affecting so many people. Like I said, I can't even tell you how many Americans I met there. Elderly, a girl with a six-month-old baby, another girl, she was young. Um, she had a brand new infant. I don't, she went there and fell for a skin. Her infant died back home. Oh. Her one and only baby. Do you think they'd let her come back for it? No. I mean, it's just... There's so much devastation and you know, people need to know that this is happening and that you have zero help from your country. And, you know, that's, you know, happening in the those third world countries where nobody seems to care, go at your own risk, which is really mm -hmm. true. You know, my, my daughter is flying to Mexico today. Um, thought she's going to someone's <laughs> home. But believe me, I've done stories on Mexico where literally, you know, the, the police are standing right next to the the cartel that is trying to kill this family. Yeah, well, and, like I said, I have proof of that the, the airport police holding a picture that I have a photograph of this Nigerian yeah. holding. How do you deny this? Mm -hmm. These are all in it together and it's yeah. all South America. Yeah. And, and you know that it is it is beware, it is be conscious. Um mm -hmm. Nobody else is going to come and fight for you. So you've got to make sure that you're there to protect yourself. Yeah. Right. And uh, and you 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 thought you were in a business transaction. 
Right. right? And, and it kind of gets scary because when you're in business, you're going to often deal with people that are from other countries. All right. And, and it's a, you know, how, I mean, how has it changed the way you conduct business now? Are you staying local and that's that? Or yeah. you know, well, proof I mean, of the, who they are first? You know yeah, I mean? I mean, my um, my business has always been, you know, working international. I've been doing this for 35 years and I work with people around the world. Ironically, um, most of them are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So they all visit here. I didn't have to go there. This was like an exception. But I have gone, like I went to Mexico for a client, gone to London. Um, but for the most part, especially now with everything, you know, on Zoom and Skype, I don't have to go anywhere. Um, but I did have another company who says, oh, you know, like even like looking for jobs at this point, are you willing to travel? And I'm like in the U.S., not traveling outside. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. No, I, I ain't leaving my doorstep. And I don't blame no. you. Um, I mean, obviously, when you came back, uh, it's. It, you know, I mean, you're back in civilization, but of course you've got the nightmares, you've got everything else there. Mm -hmm. I mean, how long did it take you? Is it still an ongoing process of just kind of realizing you are home and that you mm -hmm. are somewhat safe because if America didn't fight for you, are they going to fight for you there too, right? Yeah. So, but you know, mm -hmm. what, what was the process in, in that kind of healing and kind of coming back into life? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, I had two new grandbabies that I'd never yeah. met before then eight months old now was, was now at that point, what, four or five, five years old, yeah. you know, so now I got to spend time with them and introduce myself to the little ones. And, you know, I tried to throw myself back into the business, but the whole landscape's changed. So it's like trying to rebuild this again. Um, but I think being so caught up with work and caught up with the babies that I just kept putting it behind me. Mm -hmm. But then even writing the book, like I wrote it every day there, like a diary. When you have computers like you have here, I physically wrote it. So when I come back, I had to, um, type it all out. I'm surprised they out. let you bring it out. I, it's just handwritten. They couldn't understand it anyway because oh, they right. didn't speak English. Right. So they had no clue what I had. Um, but I had it, you know, handwritten in books. And, you know, so now I had to type it out. I give it to an editor. I have to read it again. Mm. Then everybody wanted me to put it in audio in my voice. Or the, so I kept having to relive it, relive it. And I'm mm. like, I don't want to relive it anymore. So it's done. Um, now I could kind of talk about it. But initially, I was just kind of like put it behind me. I don't want to. And even like there was like two or three people there that I was friends with there from Peru that are friends now on Facebook. And, you know, it's almost to the point where I don't want to be a jerk, but I don't want to communicate anymore because they have a very depressing life there. They're all home now, but it's a like depressing life there. And every day is just, oh, I hate it all my life. All the and now I'm using Google Translate to understand what they're saying because there it was like my Spanish and they got me so far. But it's just to the point where it's like, I just want to be back in positivity mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't want to keep living. I understand it sucks there. I get it. I was there. I don't want to keep living it again. It's kind of, I, know. I just want to. Yeah. Know, so just picking back up the pieces. And like I said, a couple people kept saying this needs to be a move into a movie. I mean, I, I've been on Locked Up Before repeatedly because apparently having a blonde hair, blue white person is like golden for them on this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I've been on Locked Up Abroad. I was on Better RTV, which was one of their Caribbean news. And um, I keep saying that, oh, if you want to be famous, this was not exactly what I had in mind. Yeah. But it's like, you know, I just think people need to be aware. You know, and yeah. again, locked up abroad. I, I was on house arrest when all of my friends apparently saw it. And I remember contacting them because it's trained by National Geographic. And I'm like, I'm still fighting the innocent. And you're posing me as this guilty drug smoker. And that's not right. And mm -hmm. they said, it's public info. It's the airport um, video. We, we're not picking sides. We just posted. And I'm like, so I was already convicted before I even had yeah. to plead guilty, you know? And like I said, even with the feedback I get from articles, you're going to get the people who just don't want to understand that not everybody who does this is guilty. I didn't go there to smuggle drugs. I'm, I'm like a health nun. I'm a vegetarian. I work out every day. I, I'm not, I didn't smoke so I'm not a drug smuggler. And I just, there was no incentive for me. I mean, people say you were doing it for a quick buck. What was in that bag? If I, if you said I had like hundreds of kilos, I'd say, okay, I get your point. What was in that bag did not even point to even remotely close to that. There was no point in me doing it. So it's right. like people need to just t take a step back and look. You know? Yeah, well, again, you know, judgment and assumption, yeah. right, before understanding. Um, the, I recently did a, a show with somebody I'd interviewed before. She's a nutritionist. Hadn't heard from her for a while, and she came back onto the scene. And her brother was a, um, a pop dealer. 
and in Texas and they wanted him and they couldn't find him. He disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so they arrested her. They said, we're either going to arrest you and put you in jail. You're going to pay for his crime or your younger brother. And so she had a, a child with autism at home. She had a business. She was a single mom. And she went to jail for two years to serve his time. That's in Texas, folks. That's insane. That's happening under your nose, right? She had done you know, nothing. She was completely innocent. It's funny because I do a podcast and I actually interviewed a girl. And you don't realize what happens in your country, too. She came in from Africa. She worked and she was, I'm sorry, yeah, from Africa. She worked in a radio station there, and she had this dream of coming here, being the next Oprah. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, they, they locked her. She was in a Cal, uh, um, L.A. Uh, airport. She got picked up there, and they, she didn't speak English, I guess. And, and, and there they speak French, which I'm surprised. In anyway. some, again, yeah, yes, in some okay. places, yeah. So they were telling her she came here to be a prostitute. And she's like, a prostitute? Like, I, she couldn't communicate. She's like, I, so then they're saying, like, um, well, she said, I'm not even dressed like a prostitute. How would you know that? Like they, she had spent a year, uh, I think it was nine months in the airport prison while she tried to fight her innocence. She eventually got out. So as I'm doing the podcast, I didn't want to say anything because I'm kind of like, it's her story, not mine. But I'm like, oh my God, I didn't, you did nine months. I did four years, but I yes. know what it was like to be in another country. You don't yes. speak the language, you're not guilty. And um, she finally got out and she speaks about it all. But I said, I wouldn't, I said, I never knew that you did that stuff. She said, most people don't. I mean, Texas is my country. I would have never thought that thing. Exactly. But there's no justice. All the no. only justice seems to be for the scammers, or the scammers are the bad people. Yeah, yeah. It's sure. it's all the money, isn't it? The backhand, mm -hmm. the money. Uh, I mean, what was in their benefit to keep her in jail for for nine months? But oh, then we've also got to kid. understand our jails are not government run or government supported. They are independent. And they're going to fill them up because they get money. They get paid to have people mm -hmm. in those jails, right? So every time you send someone to jail for something that is a misdemeanor, or, you know, they're guilty before proven innocent, yeah. uh, right? And and um, I have a book coming out, I've Forgotten Children uh, book anthology, and one of them is a foster mom. And when, you know, I first interviewed her and she talked about that 70% of foster children end up in jail, right? Because they're just... Not, not given the break not and not everything open. else and it's like uh, your system is so broken it's so broken and i'm you know i'm doing my little drop in the bucket with the book <laughs> and, the, and these podcasts but mm -hmm. until we step up and listen to this and go it happens in your own country it happens in the other country corruption is at the top of the game it's up at I your highest political level it's in your mm -hmm. highest pol uh, police level uh, another show I did, you know, talking about sex trafficking and the people that are the that are the, um, being sex trafficked to are judges, are high political people, That's doctors, nice. surgeons, you mm -hmm. name it. Uh, we've got to look at that there is a disease running through all societies, and that disease is a lack of empathy, a lack of compassion, a lack of understanding and all about um, opulence and greed on some they, level. In Peru, they used to always think U.S., like they had this vision, we were the greatest country in the whole wide world, so powerful, they wanted to be like us. And I used to tell them, we're just as corrupt as you are, to be honest. Mm -hmm. The only difference is they hide it better. You guys are just out in your face blatant about it. Exactly. Like they they yeah. hide it better. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and that's, that is the difference because nobody would believe it would happen in America. This is the land of the free. More more. Have you checked that? Have you yeah. checked that? It's more back to hang them high. Yeah, right? for sure. It really, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's um, shoot them up first. And, and yes, this is the huge call on society. So now you've come back. You've got to readjust. You've got to reconnect with your family. Clearly, you've obviously got some nightmares going on. It's hard to come back to all of that mm -hmm. and kind of like you can't just pick your life up from where it was, right? You've got to reinvent yourself in business mm -hmm. because business has changed quite considerably. And a COVID, of course, changed businesses a lot anyway. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how did you pick that ball back up? Believe it or not, I actually went to a, um, to a hypnotist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to a hypnotist years ago for um, insomnia and she was phenomenal. And I remember writing to her and I'm like, hey, remember me? And I'm telling the story. She's like, oh my God, you got to come in. So I went to her and she was kind of giving me these, like, really, anytime you feel the slightest bit of tension, like this, you might not know what it is, but your head does. 
Yes. Because remember, I was still recovering through all of this. Yes. So, you know, she would just give me these relaxing things. To, I mean, I'm still not sleeping that great, but again, I'm not intentionally thinking of stuff, but my yeah. mind is actually thinking of stuff. So, you it's know, I try ongoing. to keep myself busy. Yeah, mm-hmm. I try to keep myself busy. Um, you know, it's all you can do. So I mean, what you is can't your... undo it. Yeah, you can't undo it. Uh, nothing could be undone, but I always believe that, you know, however hard some things are, there's always a reason behind it. You know, mm-hmm. discover your strength, discover your abilities, discover, and, and, you know, with your book, with these podcasts, with everything that you're doing, is the expose of how corrupt our mm-hmm. world has got that anybody's life can be sold off at any time for a buck. Absolutely. Right? And that there is no justice. And that nobody is coming to save you, you know, and that we need the kind of the, the Rambos and whoever out there in the world that come in. It's unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we need those jailbreakers that are coming and shoot them up and can pick everybody else. Because quite honestly, because that's no, the, what other choice do you have? What other yeah. choice is that because there is no law. Because you can't have law, true law, without a conscience. And when there is no conscience, there is no law. It's funny because in my other book before Life's obstacles can be your greatest motivators. It leads up to all of the things I went through and then the other one. Mm-hmm. But that one talks about like uh, a lot of the drama. So I'll use my one ex-husband as an example. Another big scandal. He was just physically abusive, mentally abusive, robbed me blind, not just me, countless others, blah, blah, blah. Went around the U.S. scamming people, stealing from them, still does to this day. Why does he do it? Because he can. Exactly. He gets what he, they don't, he, anytime he did get arrested, they'd say, the jails are so crowded. We just don't have the space. He didn't kill anybody. Slap him on the wrist, send him home. So he just continues to do this. And yet I look at me like, and here I am spending four years in this country for something I didn't do. But yet this man can just do whatever he wants because he can. Because he paid people zero off. justice. Exactly. It's just the government says we don't have, he didn't kill anybody. We don't have the room for him. Yeah, you but do count, have the resources for thing. it. Yeah, count, you don't have to count one thing he did. Count all of the things he's done. Yes. Does that not equal something? I mean, he's right. destroyed people's lives and nobody cares. <laughs> like well, just... well, we do know that, you know, what what comes around goes around or what goes around comes around. His uppance will be somewhere along the line. Right? I hope. <laughs> um, and it, because, you know, nobody gets away with that scot-free somewhere along the line, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, something happened to them by somebody else or uh, you know, a a nice little cancer gets them or something like that. But, you know, it will happen. Um, Doesn't happen painful enough, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so many people would say, you have to forgive, you'll feel better. And I'm like, oh, my God, I've got so much hate with so many people at this point. It's like, it's not that easy. No, try. (laughs) No, And, and, you know, I'm a very spiritual person. I'm very much about feeding all the possibilities and the love and raising up to that level. But Mm -hmm. I'm not ignorant. And I know that there's a massive percentage of scum out there that are people, they're lost souls. They have no connection to heart or soul, no connection to consciousness. Some people have been brought up in it. It's all they know. Given an opportunity, they may actually rise up and move away from it. Some people are, no, this is too easy. Why should I care? I don't care as long as I'm all right. And Mm -hmm. if people are still in that state of being, there is nothing you can do about to help them because it's free will. They have to be willing to help themselves and want to rise up from out out of that system. And unfortunately, those are the people that we need to be turning our eyes on. And this isn't all the kind of low scum drug dealers or con artists or scammers. As I said, let's look at our political level. Let's look at the corporations. Let's look at all of that. And, you know, you want to drain the swamp, start draining it right there, right? Yeah. Because uh, anybody that um, manipulates other people for their own gain on any level uh, are, are people that really need to face those consequences. They need to be held accountable. I hope I see it in this lifetime. Yeah, unfortunately. Because everything's getting worse instead of better. <laughs> and, and, but that is actually kind of the system in life, isn't it? Things have got to get so bad that there has to be an uprising. It has to get to a point where people say enough is enough. And, you know, you having the courage um, to write about this, to be able to speak about it, even though you never want to actually really address it again. But at the mm-hmm. same time, you have to. Because you're speaking out for those other people that have no power to do so. 
And, you know, it may feel only like a drop in the bucket, but when more and more people drop in that bucket, the bucket starts getting full. Right. And and that voice is so important because if we don't speak out, if we don't point out, um, I, I live with uh, with someone whose friend fell for a, a love scam and we we gave her the proof. Uh, even mm-hmm. the guy that the name that he took was on on the news saying my identity was stolen. We gave mm-hmm. her the proof. No, no, no. The other guy said, no, no, he stole my identity. That's right. Yeah. 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 And, and so it's, it's, it's got to be the willingness to know you're being scammed. And of course, when you, when you're following business as usual, mm-hmm. right. And you've done it before, and then you're obviously going to think, well, obviously it's, it's, it's it may be a little bit unusual, obviously your brain, wasn't kind of firing on all all cylinders there. So some things that maybe your consciousness in the past would have gone, hang on, check that sure. one out a little well, bit more. When you I know? asked Mike, when he sent me his passport, it was like, and then the book, I, he, the passport he sent me was a gentleman named Michael Graham. So I just started calling him MG in the, passport, in the book. I remember sending it to my FBI friend. I said, is there a way to tell if this was stolen? And she circles like four things. And she's like, Penny, this is fake. Like they were things on it. And I remember writing to him saying, how dare you, you tried to scam me. And he was like, how dare you? I wanted, I, my passport was stolen. I've never asked you for a dime. All I wanted to do was help you. And I'm like, so I'm asking a kid who referred me. And he was like, he's never asked you for anything, Patty. All he wants to do. So I'm like, it is true. He never asked me for anything. But again, and like now I'd be like, oh, no way. But back then my brain wasn't understanding. I'm like, well, oh, that is true, you know. So I know because you you know you want to believe there's good in people, and you know if mm-hmm. we have to go around believing that everybody's bad under layer, <laughs> then you know then what's the point of living? You know, life, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We we have to um, we have to kind of give the benefit of the doubt, and but it does mean that we've got to do more due diligence. So you know your work now, you know, is it um, obviously you're not traveling anywhere to see anyone. Right. Um, you've pivoted into a different direction now. Right. So what line, you know, what are you doing now? Um, it's still the same. It's, you know, marketing, investor relations, public relations. Um, like you said, the whole industry's changed. So when I came home, I had to basically study, study, get cert- certifications and various like digital marketing, various new things that were going on because I started saying, okay, what can I do now that people are doing now? Because everything's remote now, everything's digital now. Mm-hmm. So I spent a lot of time studying, taking courses, um, getting certified. It was a little tricky because now there's a thing where people say there's no such thing as age discrimination. Yes, there mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to the point I was sending out resumes and I was asking for the same salary you pay somebody who's 20 years old, but yeah. yet they would pick them. And I'm like, what experience is that? I've got yes. three decades of experience and I'm not asking for it. So, you know, it's just... I just keep pushing forward, pushing forward. And I said, I'm not, I'm not a quitter. If this hasn't proved anything, I'm not a quitter. So I just keep pushing, you know, but again, the scammers, like I had two clients come on board, work with them diligently for seven months, never paid me. It's like, you know, and this is again in the U.S., but, uh, you know, I keep pushing forward. Now I change my contract. You pay up front. We're not playing yeah. this game. So yeah. little by little, we're getting back to where I was, but it's right. a better late than never. Yes, exactly. But but it's also, I mean, how much of your kind of experience in those four years have now has kind of become even a part of your business and not just obviously people paying up front, but yeah. there's always lessons to learn and there's always something that you can apply. Have there yeah. been any particular things that you have applied to your business now that, you know, because of the experience? Yeah, if anything, it's just a lot more... Um you know, I guess because I'm not a quitter, I just, I just keep pushing forward and I'm like, you're not going to break me. So if mm. there's stuff that, like I would look online and say, okay, someone in this position, what skills are you looking for? If I don't have them, I'm going to get them. You know, and I, I really put for every effort. I got, you see my website, I got tons of certifications through the, the past three years that I'm home. Cause I'm like, if there's something I don't know, I'm going to learn it because I'm not going to let them beat me. You know, it was the same that I had the attitude I had there. I'm not going to let them beat yeah. me. You know, so that's kind of the attitude I'm putting forward now. And now, you know, I kind of see different sides of people now. So mm. trying to guide clients, it's like, okay, I know what you're thinking. Here's how the other side, we got to make sure it's the big picture, you know, especially for the yeah. marketing realm. 
Yeah. And, you know, in marketing, you know, we want to market to the right people in the right way, but we've got to make sure we're not marketing to the scammers as well. Right? Especially with everything online now. For exactly. Sure. Exactly, because it's like, how do you protect yourself? And right. that's something that's really important. So adding that protection because of your experience is a real added bonus. Mm -hmm. So uh, what kind of clients are you looking for? I work with everybody. I mean, that's a tricky part for what I do because some people in my space either do only with technology, only with healthcare, blah, blah, blah. But I've been doing this. I've always been on the agency side. So mm -hmm. I've worked with clients around the world in just about every niche under the sun. Um, but I've gotten so many different um, unique kind of clients now. Like one is um, a company who's creating this tech or has this technology in place where they're going to um, like CO2 emissions. Like I think it's mm -hmm. COP28. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, they have a platform that can, you know, basically break the break in half the CO2 emissions by 2030. Another one is like this healthcare company. I'm like, they're different from what I'm normal yet. But at this point, I've branched out into so many different things and learned so many different things. I'm like, I got this. <laughs> so You've got this. Yeah. <laughs> the day that you jumped out of the plane to go skydiving, I mean, what went wrong that day? Well, I was doing it for 30, um, for uh, 15 years and I was actually an instructor, but it's kind of like driving. You could be the greatest driver in the whole wide world, but get hit from behind. Well, it's something similar. I was jumping, but I was with somebody who didn't have the experience that I had. So the way it works in skydiving, when you reach a certain altitude, you agree with whoever you're jumping with and we're going to break apart. So I was flying in what they call like a vertical position, which you're flying at 175 miles an hour. Wow. You break off to a horizontal, you break away so that you can open up your parachute and not risk entangling. But the person who was above me wasn't as experienced. Not paying attention that, okay, what's this altitude? They're going to be breaking off. He was coming down in a vertical position. So that's 175 miles an hour. When you go horizontal, you lessen. Well, he wasn't paying attention and came right into me. So he hit me so hard that it knocked my helmet off. Apparently, he broke his knee. They said his kneecap was flying off. Um, he I broke my back and my neck and my throat. I fell unconscious. Now, I had in my parachute what's called an AAD, an automatic activation device. It's not a requirement, but I had it. And what that's meant to do is that if you're falling below a certain altitude at a certain speed, it's programmed to say something's not right and it'll deploy your parachute. That's what saved my life. Yes. But it deployed the parachute at like a few hundred feet in the air. I was still unconscious. I don't have any memory of any of this. And I landed in a tree. I guess I got airlifted from there and went to a hospital. I spent a month in the hospital. And they did a surgery on my neck. They put a metal bracket to prevent paralysis. I guess with my back, I had um, like a race that they put on my back but then after a month they said we physically can't do anything more for her we can send her home and she'll do like outpatient therapy but mentally you kind of just have to wait it out you know? yeah so yeah, that, my, so. my daughter actually works with people with brain injuries mm -hmm. um that is uh, that is her line of work and for some time for some of them it's just a, you know kind of introducing play introducing something else mm -hmm. because it really is kind of reigniting certain neurons in the brain mm -hmm. that are damaged, right? And, yeah. Well, my sister was saying that, like, in the hospital, I guess I was functioning as a five-year-old. So, you know, like, at one point, they, I guess they made a circle, and they said, make a clock to see if I know how to put the numbers. And apparently, I did two eyes and a smile and, like, turned on SpongeBob on the TV. I'm like, I don't, you know, they just said, you just have to read it out. And little by little, like I said, it got to the point where on the surface, I appeared fine. But I guess that certain little pieces was seeing the red flags, seeing the, the right from wrong. But what the funny part was, like, I've always worked since I'm 13. So I remember them saying, don't go back to work right away. But I'm like, I'm on home and I'm trying to watch TV, but I wasn't understanding channels and what, what put me in front of the computer. And I felt at home because yeah. I've been doing this for so long. So I just threw myself out back in. And on that level, I was totally fine. It was everyone else that still had issues. But to the naked eye, you couldn't really see that. So, I mean, your poor husband, from one moment you're in hospital, rain and dream, next you're in a jail for four years, you know? <laughs> I tease him now because he doesn't have, like, much gray hair at all. I said, why not doing my job right now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's a saint. I mean, he's definitely, like, I, he, well, he keeps saying, is this it? Nothing else because I yes. can't take anything else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, let's face it, an awful lot of spouses would have been gone, right? Sure. And, he, yeah. and he didn't. He fought for you and he fought, and, you know, 
waited for you and everything else. Mm-hmm. And that is, uh, that's when you know you've got the right love partner, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he was going through a counselor at that when, when I was in Korea because yes. he needed somebody to talk to. And even they said, you know, if you guys could survive this, you will be together forever because nothing right. can break you after this. You yes. Know? Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, when, when you have an accident and you're in hospital, you're in the hands of the doctors and you know that this is your part to play afterwards. But when you're in jail and you're powerless and you're doing everything right, but nothing is working, you know, that sense of, of, of I feel I'm letting her down, but it That's wasn't him. Felt. It was the system. Um, it, it was your own country that was letting you down. So yeah. Same yeah. with my mom, between him and my mom, they were just you know, because it's the same, if it's your kid, you know, you just Mm. feel like I have to get her home, and he felt completely helpless, and it's like, you know, again, it it was hard for them to understand that it's not you, you know? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, um, you, what, your business right now if you're what are you offering, um, how can people get hold of you, what kind of clientele are you serving? Anybody who's looking for investor relations, public relations, and marketing. Like I said, I've won countless awards from my work, from myself and my clients. And you could see where I've been featured in and on various magazines, covers, and whatnot, because I'm good at what I do. Um, and my website is www.christineadvisors.com, and that's advisors with an E-R-S. Um, my email, pbaranowski at christineadvisors.com. Um, Could you just spell of- that to, for people who yeah. are listening, Liv? Yep. It's P-B-A-R-O-N-O-W-S-K-I at P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-A-D-V-I-S-E-R-S dot com. And yeah, I mean, um, like I said, I've worked for paper and pulp, um, ed tech, financial companies, healthcare companies, restaurants, you name it, I've worked with them. Um, I always say marketing is marketing. The only thing that changes is the story of who you're telling it to. Exactly. The, the why the why they're doing it and to whom yeah. it's for exactly right. but you know i mean you can have great marketers out there i've interviewed a number of them but somebody with such resilience such tenacity and mm-hmm. um, with such a story to tell you're seeing in between things that perhaps you wouldn't have seen before and that maybe mm-hmm. others are missing and it's also you know that there's little warning bells and certain things because anybody can fall for a scam And let's face it, they are getting very, very sophisticated. This is it. You've got an open government one going on um, with, um, what do they call him now? The orange Jesus, Uh, (laughs) the latest thing. And it's blatant and it's in your face and you are being utterly scanned. And and if you are unaware of that, then, you know, Mm -hmm. you're being taken for a ride. Or even if you are aware of that, you don't care. So Mm -hmm. I think it's time to care. It's time to stand up for each other. And uh, and it's really time to hold all governments responsible for their actions, and they should be there protecting their citizens. I'm not saying, well, you fell for it; it's your fault. No, I mean, you, if it you... was something stupid that I just fell for scam, I get it. But yeah. I was not in my right frame of mind. Right. U.S. knew this; we have proof. Yeah. And the fact that they didn't care. Yes. They should be ashamed of themselves. Exactly. And anybody who's listening. Any connections in the embassy, that first lawyer who's scamming needs to be taken off. And that next lawyer needs to be put on because he's the one who got me home. He deserves to be on there. And anybody with any connections or whatnot to help spread this word, this is a story people need to hear. Yes. And please do share it. You know, share the book, share the story, share the podcast, have the conversations. Mm -hmm. You know somebody who's being scammed. If it isn't you, you know somebody. Mm -hmm. You know somebody that you've made past judgment on, an assumption on, and that now Mm -hmm. you're re-looking at in a different way. It is up to us to be the change that others seek because there are others that can't speak for themselves. And you think if it's only happening overseas? No. No, Mm -hmm. absolutely not. It's happening in your own country. Anywhere where there's a payoff, that they can be paid off, they will be. There is no honor. There is no honor there. And when you do find somebody of honor and integrity, get behind them. Be the wind underneath their wings because there's so few and far between. And we need more of them. And uh, we need to rise up with them because if we don't, that scamming is just going to become mainstream on every level. And there will be no rights whatsoever. Amen. <laughs> I, I have a hard story to tell. I mean, it's, it's you know, I thought when I was uh, doing the other one of two years and, and, and she wrote, um, you know, the guru, um, you know, in jail. But it's, um, it, it's just so hard to believe that it, you, you, 
you kind of were voiceless. It didn't matter what you were saying. I yeah. said my first two years, I tried every which way, you know, as I'm to, to fight, fight, fight. And then I just got to a point where it's like, realize, what am I fighting for? It yeah. doesn't matter. You just, and I kept telling, you know, at that point, my whole mentality of talking to my family, I knew they were sad and I'm trying to cheer them up. Because I was like, I get it. You know, like I remember calling my mom on Christmas and she's all depressed and like counting down the days. You know, meanwhile, I'm thinking, I'm yeah, not a Christmas smoke. No but it's like I get it and I know how helpless you feel. But it just it's pointless. There's nothing anybody could do. Or, or I shouldn't say that there's nothing anybody would do. Would do until you find mm -hmm. the right person that stepped mm -hmm. up. And you know, you went through this with a brain injury and you still came mm -hmm. out the other side. And that really does show your strength and your resilience and your tenacity and the mm -hmm. fact that no matter how often you would like to give up, you didn't. Mm -hmm. And that is a testament to your strength, your inner strength. And anybody who does hire you on any level and wants <laughs> to talk to you about your book, that is an example of what they can be. And mm -hmm. yeah, we don't always choose what, choose what happens to us. You know, we could go down this road in trust and something happens. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that sometimes is the name of the game, but it's what we do with it, right? Mm -hmm. And what we do with it is what's important. How do people get hold of the book, love? Um, they're all on Amazon. Um, if they could, uh, um, one is called Life's Obstacles Can Be Your Greatest Motivators. Then we have Flyer Beware. And then the other one is Investor Relations, Public Relations, or Google my, uh, put my name in Amazon, Patricia Baranowski, and they should pop up. <laughs> right. And Flyer Beware, you know, her four-year yeah, deal in a Prevering mm -hmm. Prison, you know, it is, you know where you're going, know why you're going there. Um, you know, it's, uh, a, and, and you really are flying at risk. I mean, Peru relies on tourism. They do. Relies they on it. And yet you. at the same time, look what they do. It's right? money for them. They don't care yeah. about you at all. It's how much money can we get out of these people? Because yeah. like I said, you have to pay to work. You have to pay to be there. If we had the light come off in our cell one time, you pay for that, not their problem. So now we're in the dark. They don't have money. And I'm like, you kidding? It's just some money that you have to, if you, you have to work there, you have to pay to work. Even the one prison that there's prisons in every other section, but the one prison I calculated, and I'm like, it's bringing in about ninety thousand um, dollars a, a week for this person, and for them that's a lot of money. And I'm thinking that's paying the staff, the what they call MPs, which are their local police. There, um, the police, the judge, paying the rice, the food, the phones. I'm like, this is money for them. That's yes. why we're all here. They don't yep. care. That's why your sentences are astronomical because they're like, well, we just, have, you know, you're supporting the country. Yeah. <laughs> let's find a more ethical way of supporting yes. your citizens right and, yes. and and please don't turn the other cheek you know we you know we don't want you to go over to the border and start yelling and screaming no there's ways of doing it but you mm -hmm. know it is sharing the story sharing the story sharing the story sharing it with your congress sharing mm -hmm. it with with your you know um all political people are you aware of this who's mm -hmm. going to stand up you know, where this person, One person you know, chose has to take the stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone's got to take the stand. But we need, you know, you're the, you're the individual, um, but we need the people that are are going to be there for other people because mm -hmm. that's what's really, really important. Because mm -hmm. if we're not there for each for other folks, then, then what? What is it all about? Right? For sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing here today. That's a, a hard story um, to hear with what you went through and the feeling of helplessness. I'm so glad you're home. And thank you mm -hmm. for finding the guts to write the book and share mm -hmm. the story, although you'd love to leave it in the past. <laughs> you know that the, you know, there was a reason behind it that it has to be told. And mm -hmm. anybody looking for any form of marketing for their business, you want this woman. She's yes. a fighter. She's going to fight <laughs> for you. <laughs> she doesn't give up and she doesn't this give is all in. Since I'm, this is all since I'm home. I don't quit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You don't quit. And that is exemplary. It really is. So thank you for, um, for being who you are and just showing us how mm -hmm. resilience can really uh, help one get through things because uh, many you. people are going through stuff and it's like it's nothing compared we don't want you to compare because it's your you know your problem <laughs> you're going through but if she can survive that you can find something inside of you really and survive it's all downhill it from here yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not uh, uphill uphill yes, yes. You know, you're downhill yes well yeah yes, it's all uphill the top of the you, mountain yes. is waiting for you right no, no more exactly. sewage <laughs> yeah no <laughs>
So thank, thank you so thank much you. for sharing. And folks, please, you are so much more than you think you are, but please share this uh, uh, podcast out, share her book out, start the conversation. It's going on in your country, no matter where you are. It's never mind just these other countries that are looking at as a financial advantage. Where are your rights as a human being? And if we let those slide, then you have nothing. You have nothing at all. So please keep this conversation going because you never know. It could be you. It could be somebody you love and we don't want to see them go through that. So thank you. Until next time, folks, bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. There are so many more for you here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com. Just go to the podcast tag at the top there and you will see all the many genres and all 3,000 shows ready for your listening. We are here to serve you, to help you on your journey of life. And we know that through inspiration, it begets invitation. We are supported by you, the listeners, and those that we interview. Anything that you can spare us in donation would be greatly accepted and we do hope that you enjoy the next show.